everyone in this room is passionate about what wealthy countries can do to extend more opportunity and more prosperity, more development to poor people around the world. I'm going to talk about labor mobility, international labor mobility, the movement of people between countries, because labor mobility is the biggest idea in development that no one really tried. Labor mobility has already shown that it can do more to extend opportunity, prosperity to poor people in some settings than anything else we've thought of. And it can do a lot more if we choose to unleash its power. So let's back up for a second and talk about the big problem of international development. What is the big problem of international development? Everyone would give a different answer to that. For me personally, the big problem of international development is that when I lived in Colombia, I knew many people who had more talent and gave more effort than I did, and yet I earn a much higher standard of living than they had. Um, in other words, the world looks a little like this. Uh, people with the same endowments of ability, people with the same energy, earn as a return for their labor, their labor vastly different amounts in different places. This is what my co-authors and I call the place premium. The returns to the labor, the amount you can sell your labor for, differs between countries sometimes by 300%, 500%, 1,000%. And the big question is, what can we do to get convergence between this amount, between the amount that I can sell my labor for in different places? As wealthy countries have traditionally conceived this problem, it's the problem of globalizing factors of production, things that make people more or less productive in different places. And this has happened. Trade in goods and services is enormously more liberalized now than it was a generation or two ago. Movement of capital, hugely more global than it was a generation or two ago. And I'm not just talking about for-profit investment, but also gifts like remittances and foreign aid, which is at an all-time high. Human capital is being globalized. Net primary school enrollment in Africa has more than doubled in the last 20 years. Secondary school enrollment in Latin America more than doubled in the last 20 years. And there's been tremendous globalization as well of things like political institutions, technologies, the software that make economies productive. So after decades of this, after 60 years of this following World War II, it's a good time to ask how it's going. Is this getting convergence between the returns to labor in different places or not? Um, this is what Lant Pritchett calls everything but labor globalization, a uh, professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard. Is everything but labor globalization getting us convergence? The answer to that is for a few people in a few places, definitely, and for many people in many places, not at all. So what you're looking at here is income per capita in real terms adjusted to US prices. This is the, the annual standard of living you can expect on average in different countries. The US and France for the, last 20 year, for the last 60 years going way up. And some countries are converging. Korea is well on its way to becoming a rich country if it isn't already. And China is soaring. It's soaring toward us. Convergence is happening for some countries. For many countries, it's not. For many countries, the story is divergence and not convergence. Here you're looking at Colombia, Egypt, India, Ghana, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, divergence is the story. And note, most of these are, are, are places where things are going pretty well. Growth is happening in Colombia, Egypt, India, Ghana. We're not even talking about places like Haiti, Cambodia, uh, Chad, where things are much more difficult. Divergence is the story for lots and lots of, place, of people in lots and lots of places. These are very aggregate statistics, so let's look at something very concrete, which is here on the vertical axis, the living standard, the annual living standard at US prices, US dollars, you can expect for driving a bus in different countries. Uh, according to the International Labor Organization, the USA and Great Britain, since 1985, steadily increasing down at the bottom, Mexico, Peru, India, Madagascar, Philippines. 
again, for lots of people in lots of places, divergence is the big story of the last several decades, not convergence. In other words, as a tool for getting that convergence, for solving this big problem of international development, everything but labor has failed as a generalized solution to that problem. So a, a, a big question is what works? And I'm gonna argue that we actually know very well what works. What, what works is replacing everything but labor globalization with real globalization, true globalization of everything and labor. And the way that we know that is that we have historical experience in this area. The US is a great country with a long experience in migration. And for most of our history, setting aside a big exception, which is Chinese people, for most of our history, we had very few policy barriers to any immigration to the United States up until World War I. And what happened during that period was convergence with some of the most important migrant sending countries. The vertical axis here is wages relative to the United States. And here we're talking about unskilled wages. These are male urban construction wages collected by economic historian Jeffrey Williamson relative to the US. So 1.0 means the same as the US. 0.5 means half of the US. And here are wages in Great Britain, Germany, Ireland, Norway, Sweden in the late 19th century going all the way up until World War I converging with our living standards. And what all of these countries have in common is that there was massive labor mobility out to the New World, other places as well, but mostly the United States. Um, what did immigration policy look like during that time? This is a, a, a page from the original form of the 1870 census of the United States. The interviewer was walking, through, uh, walking along a street in Dayton, Ohio. It's an immigrant neighborhood, as you can see, people born in Bavaria, Prussia, and some in Ohio. And, uh, they interviewed my great-great-great-grandfather, Nicholas Clemens, who at that time was a 62-year-old guy born in Bavaria, working as a livestock tender. When he came in 1842, he roughly tripled his earnings. A half century later, he couldn't do that anymore, but not because the US was poorer, not because the US was dragged down by that huge wave of immigration, but because Germany got richer, and a big part of that as economic historians Jeffrey Williamson, Timothy Hatton, Kevin O'Rourke, and others have shown, was because of labor mobility. Um, when Nicholas Clemens came, he got off the boat in New Orleans and got to work. No passport, no visas, no restrictions. That's what immigration policy looked like then. Today, it looks a little more like this for a lot of people. This is a high seas interdiction by the US Coast Guard of a boat full of 380 potential immigrants from, from uh, Haiti, 18 miles off the coast of Haiti in April 2004. Um, these uh, agents took everybody off the boat, forced them to return to Haiti. Um, of the 380 people, uh, 62 of them were children. Here are some of the people that were on the boat. And among them was also this gentleman. He was taken off the boat, forced to return to Haiti. Now, here's where we see another aspect of everything but labor globalization. I've argued that everything but labor globalization has been a failure as a generalized solution to the problem of convergence. But there's another aspect, which is a sinister aspect. And it's that if I were to tell you that agents of the US government forced this man not to take a job that he was qualified for in Florida, because he was born a black man, most of the people in the United States would have a problem with that. If I were to tell you instead what actually happened, which is that agents of the US government forced this man not to take a job in Florida because he was born in Haiti, many people around the world would not have a problem with that. Now, um, it's a little strange for a white guy born in the United States to be talking about these things. So let's take a minute to ask some migrants, some low-skill migrants, what they think of the same issue. 
Um, it's not often that we hear from low-skill migrants. Many people don't uh, spend a lot of their time hanging out with these people. But I want to show you just one minute of the trailer to an unfinished documentary film. Uh, it's called Borders Question, and it's being made now. It's unfinished. It's being made now by two filmmakers, Ivan Gaten and Sarah Estakai. And what they did, well, one of the things they did is go to Mexico near Tijuana and to Cameroon in Africa and ask people how they felt about being forced not to go places they want and take jobs they want. How did that feel to them? And why is this happening to them? And these were some of the, the uh, answers that they got. La situation actuelle ressemble à la patate, ou alors elle est même plus que la patate parce que il y a une discrimination totale. C'est-à-dire quoi Il y a des barrières que les, 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 les États occidentaux mettent au niveau de leurs ambassades. Pour eux, nous sommes vraiment des singes. Vous savez qu'il y a beaucoup de racistes aussi qui ne veulent pas que d'autres travaillent, qui travaillent que d'autres travaillent. Que travaillent pues igual que ellos. C'est difficile pour que le blanc c'est le noir. Les Américains de là viennent ici uh -huh. et nous ici les traitons bien. Okay. Donc pourquoi nous n'avons pas le droit à nous aller là Je crois que le noir a le droit de voyager comme il veut, d'aller là où il veut. Comme le blanc aussi, il quitte le chez lui, il vient chez nous, c'est comme ça. Je ne peux pas parler que je vais voler. Non Ce que je fais au Cameroun, je peux bien le faire en France, mais je n'ai pas accès. So we see that there's something to this. It's, it's not a, a, a false analogy to be denied the opportunity to, uh, to, to compare being denied the opportunity to go where you want and work in what you want to do based on your country of birth as it is based on your race. Those are two things that have uh, nothing inherently to do with your ability to do a job, for example. Um, now, it, it's around this time that anybody I'm talking to about these issues uh, is very likely to say, but Michael, you're crazy. What are you talking about? I mean, sure, it seems that labor mobility is very effective at reducing poverty for any given poor person. It seems that there are ethical problems with restricting labor mobility. But if you take these things to their logical conclusion, you're talking about free labor mobility. And that's crazy for three reasons at least, uh, one of which is that we would have to go under beneath, uh, submerged beneath a, a wave of humanity that would want to come. Um, the second, that labor mobility can't be the answer. I mean, where would all of Nigeria go anyway? Uh, and the third, that Michael's on drugs, this is politically impossible, and no migration policy that is development friendly is ever going to, to happen or come close to happening. So to finish, I want to talk about each of these three. The idea that, uh, immigration has to hurt us and has to bring us down has been around for a very long time. People were talking about it 100 years ago and continue to talk about it. We have a lot of experience now in very good statistics and it might be time to look at some of them and see if there's a relationship, for example, between immigration and unemployment. So here is permanent immigration to the U.S. since 1880 in every year in millions of people. And you can see uh, a huge wave of, of immigrants before World War I, a level to which we have recently returned. Now unemployment, since 1890. You can see the depression of the 1890s here, the Great Depression with 20, 25% unemployment, and our recent economic crisis. This is uh, up until September 2009. Overlaying them, it's right to ask, is there a positive relationship between these things? When we see more immigration, do we see more unemployment in the United States? There's a relationship, all right, and it's an inverse relationship. That is, in times of economic crisis, immigration goes way down because there aren't jobs and policy barriers go up. You can see that in the Great Depression, too. And in times when the economy is doing well, unemployment is low, people come. The experience of the last century plus has not been that in times of high immigration we have bad economic performance, poor employment conditions. It's exactly the opposite. Could it be that immigrants are cheapening jobs, even if they aren't taking them away from people who are here? 
uh, this is something that has been studied profoundly by many very smart economists over several years. And right now, the academic debate, to put it in a kind of cartoon form, is between George Borjas at Harvard's Kennedy School, who calculates that 20 years of immigration to the United States collectively, authorized and unauthorized, cumulatively at the end of 20 years, lowered the wages of the average American worker by 3%. Not 3% a year, 3% cumulatively, which is a little over 0.1% a year. And Giovanni Peri at University of California, Davis, who has a slightly different model in which uh, immigrant labor is more complementary to native labor than in George Borjas's model, and he estimates that there's actually a modest positive effect on wages. I want to point out that this most pessimistic estimate and this most optimistic estimate are both roughly zero compared to the wage gain that Lant Pritchett, Claudio Montenegro, and I calculated of 680% for a Haitian stepping off the boat into Florida. That is, if there is any point later on at which the US resembles a lifeboat, and it's either their poverty or our poverty, a zero-sum game. We are so far away from that that we don't even need to think about it now. We are galaxies away from that point. So what about the second objection, which is that migration can't be the solution for a large number of poor people? I am sure that migration can't be the main solution for most poor people on Earth in the hypothetical world in which there is no poverty. But let's talk about the real world and ask a different question, which is how important has migration been to actual poverty reduction that has actually happened, that has already happened right now? And to ask that question, I'm going to set a poverty line, which is $10 a day at US prices. That's actually a very conservatively low poverty line because the real US poverty line is over $28 a day for a single adult. So this is, this is a, a standard of living at which I and most of the people I know would consider them, themselves completely destitute. And I'm going to show you 100 Mexicans who somehow got over that line and are today living over $10 a day in income. And the question is, for every 100 of those people, Mexicans who got out of poverty, uh, where do they live? If we have 100 Mexicans who got out of poverty by this standard of poverty, and they either live in the United States or Mexico, how many are here? That is, for what fraction of those people was movement the way that they got out of poverty? And it turns out that it's 43%. 43 out of every 100 Mexicans who ever got over $10 a day, this bare minimum living standard to get out of poverty, and did it either in the US or Mexico, did it here. That is, uh, here's what everything but labor globalization has done for poverty reduction in Mexico cumulatively to date. And here's what true globalization, including labor, has done for Mexicans. Huge role. How about Haiti? You can already see that this is going to be different. Uh, here are 100 Haitians who got out of poverty and even either live in the United States or Haiti. For them, it turns out that 82 out of every 100 did it here. So here again is what everything but labor globalization is doing for Haitians, which is not much. And here's what true globalization is doing for Haitians. Don't let anybody tell you that labor mobility can't be a big part of the solution. It already has been in many settings. And by the way, this isn't just true for uh, small, relatively small nearby countries. We can do the same thing for India. And it turns out that of every 100 Indians who are over $10 a day, who either live in India or the United States, 27 live here. So even for a vast India, which is benefiting quite a lot in places like Bangalore, or Hyderabad, and Mumbai from everything but labor globalization, true globalization is doing quite a lot. So last objection, that Michael's on drugs, that, that none of this is politically possible. What you're looking at is one of the most fascinating documents in American history, and it's very little known. This is Benjamin Franklin in February of 1790, petitioning the US Congress to end slavery, the last public act of his life, because he died two months later. Not just 
end the slave trade, but actually end the institution once and for all of ownership of Americans by other Americans. Because of Franklin's standing, they actually debated this petition in Congress for two days. And there's a fascinating transcript of the discussion of, uh, of, uh, of this proposal. Um, lots of practical objections to it. Uh, who is going to compensate the slave owners for the property expropriated from them? Uh, what is the mixing of races going to do to American values and character? Uh, slavery goes back to the Greeks and Romans. It's never going to go away. On and on and on. And to us now, these things seem crazy. But Franklin was the crazy one at this time. Um, don't let anyone tell you that what's right is impossible. And it might not even be hypothetically possible. What if it already happened in settings where it seemed completely impossible? This is a, a photograph taken in downtown Pretoria, South Africa, in May of this year. And you might ask yourself, how did all of these black people get into downtown Pretoria? And the answer is that white people chose to let them in by policy decision. For generations, South Africa had a complex and highly restrictive set of regulations on the movement of black people, where they could work, where they could live, when they could go there, what jobs they could take. And in the early 1990s, the white controlled government didn't just loosen or relax those restrictions, they dropped them like a rock, flushed them completely. And you can see what they were afraid of. It was reasonable for them to be afraid. This is uh, average income per year, again at US prices, US living standards, for a white South African in the early 90s, and for a black or colored South African, those are terms from the South African census, uh, at the same time, noting that for every white there were seven extremely poor black people. You can imagine them being afraid of a wave of humanity overcoming everything they had and everything that they knew. But what happened instead was convergence. We talked about convergence, and that happened in South Africa since the abolition of apartheid. Uh, this is a, the distribution of an index uh, of, called the Comprehensive Welfare Index. It's just a blend of income, private assets, and access to public services. All this is showing is that for the median black household, this index has soared since apartheid went away. And actually, big changes in the rest of the distribution, too. What happened for whites? Modest increases. That is, convergence, even in South Africa, even with that huge ratio of very poor black people to whites, convergence has been blacks coming up fast towards where whites are and not dragging whites down. What does this mean for the world? Well, here's the world on the same graph. Up here is the average income of people in high income OECD countries as defined by the World Bank. There is average income in developing countries as defined by the World Bank and the population ratio six to one. That is, there are important ways in which the world now looks like South Africa did in the early 1990s. And a lot of people are afraid for the same reasons of what might happen, but I want to point out that this actually got convergence. If we want convergence, we might want to move toward true globalization. And now we have the chance to be, like Ben Franklin, ahead of our times um, and support true globalization. So how could we do that? One very concrete way to do that would be to support a large increase in the number of legal ways for people qualified to work in this country to work here temporarily, guest worker visas. Um, this is something that people who care about poverty reduction can really get behind because they don't want people to have to die in the desert and at sea to be able to come work hard, improve their lives, and build the US economy. And it's something that people who care about national security can get behind because there's one thing in common between all three people who have ever held the post of Secretary of Homeland Security under Presidents Bush and Obama, and it's that they support a big guest worker visa program. For them, it's about taking movements that now occur in the dark and bringing them into the light. But this is something that lots and lots of people can get behind. And 
true globalization means extending opportunity to people born without it, but who deserve it just as much as me. Thanks very much. <laughs>